Okay, welcome back. My name is Julian Stalabras, and I'm pleased, or at least I think I'm pleased, to be chairing uh, this session on uh, war and violence, so the kind of bloodier end of uh, uh, apocalyptic, apocalyptic visions. Um, I am very pleased to be introducing first my PhD student, Erica Payette, uh, who's uh, uh, been researching the history of French journalism in the uh, first Persian Gulf War. Uh, a really interesting topic, especially since uh, the war is notorious for not having very much photography, or at least that's the, that's the myth. She studied art history and the history of photography at the École de Louvre and cultural and creative industries at King's College London. And she's worked on the art market and at Parasol Unit Foundation for Contemporary Art in London before returning to academic research. So she draws on this interdisciplinary background um, with her PhD research, which brings together art history, post-colonial theory, uh, media, war, and visual studies. So please welcome her. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian, for your kind introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here um, speaking about the um, aftermath photography of the first Gulf War and the burning oil wells as visions of apocalypse. From February 1991, towards the end of the first Persian Gulf War, it was reported that the Iraqi army had started to set Kuwait's numerous oil wells on fire. When describing the events, witnesses often employed an epic tone and apocalyptic metaphors referring to either hell or the end of the world. I would like to ask in this talk the following questions. What do images of this event typically look like? And what did it mean to associate them with the concept of apocalypse? What collective anxieties was this framing of the images revealing of? What other narratives did this one obscure? One of the most striking examples of the framing of this event as the biblical apocalypse came in the French weekly publication Le Figaro magazine with an article entitled Apocalypse Kuwait, as you can see here, um, featuring four flush double-page photographs by Bruno Barbet, a member of the photojournalism agency Magnum Photos. Um, the intense sensory characteristics of this catastrophic event were indeed reminiscent of certain passages of the book of Revelation in the Bible's New Testament, such as the sky being darkened during both day and night, the apparition of horses, martyrs enduring their martyrdom, fire burning everything down, rivers being poisoned, and the idea of armies coming from the, the river Euphrates, sending a plague of fire and smoke. So for journalists and photojournalists, the, the motif of the apocalypse and its loaded art historical references was therefore a ready pattern, imbued with a media-friendly sense of threat and authoritative moral dimension. Um, to be sure, the, the use of the apocalyptic metaphor applied to devastating fires is not unique to the Gulf War context. It was seen, for instance, alongside this um, montage by Kenneth Phillips um, of Tony Blair in Iraq, and more recently about the Amazon fires, with very similar images, really. Um, <clears throat> But photographers of the 1991 Kuwaiti fires were subjugated by this unprecedented spectacle and confronted with the challenge of conveying non-visual characteristics, such as the vastness of the desert, um, the asphyxiating sensation of oil particles in the air, um, the, the very intense heat and the smell and noise, and the danger of unexploded landmines around them. Photographically speaking, question of, questions of lighting were critical in this peculiar environment in which even in the middle of the day, natural light was dim and surreal because of the thick smoke cloud obscuring the sun. These unusual working conditions posed acute technological challenges which impaired the material conditions of photography. There was oil dust covering cameras and lenses and the equipment and film were melting under the intense heat. Um, so these are mostly landscape photographs, often representing vast expanses 
of empty desert with a strong horizon line in the far distance, either low in the frame um, with the, the motif of smoke clouds oversaturating the visual field or alternatively at the top of the frame foregrounding the soiled ground. So visually, as well as in their interpretation as visions of apocalypse, these images can be related to the legacy of the romantic sublime. For instance, uh, in their affinities with paintings such as these by Turner and John Martin. This affinity of some war photography with the sublime has been amply remarked upon and discussed by scholars. Sarah James, for, ex for instance, wrote about uh, the aftermath photography of the early 2000s war on terror and she developed the idea of military sublime, as she called it. But she cautioned about relying uncritically on this aesthetic cate category, which she said, I quote, has too often been a hiding place for postmodernists. In other words, uh, it, it has been a mechanism of depoliticization. Like her, other scholars have challenged the apolitical character of the sublime and showed, for instance, how an individual's response to the natural sublime is one that tells us about the specific cultural values in which certain natural phenomena have been inscribed throughout history. This particular idea comes from Sean Duffy, a specialist in 18th century natural sublime in literature. Um, the Gulf War took place in 1990-1991. Therefore, Cold War logic continued to imbue the way the Gulf War was experienced by contemporaries. Given the pervasive anxiety about the possibility of a nuclear winter during the Cold War, I want to replace these images in the context of the then latest iteration of the sublime, which was the, nu the nuclear sublime. The philosophical concept of nuclear sublime during the Cold War gave rise to much literature from both postmodernists and their criti critics, um, revolving around competing conceptions of what constitutes reality. Um, in other words, um, yielding to the idea of nuclear sublime plunges us in a world where rationality and reality are ne nearly impossible. And it's interesting to note that the same philosophers who wrote about Cold War culture, uh, such as uh, Baudrillard, Virilio, Lyota, or Derrida, often found a continuation of their thinking in the Gulf, War, Gulf War's new military and media technologies. So the war was deemed virtual and surreal by most of them, and was therefore seen as the epitome of this conceptual debate. This vision of the war, this particular vision of the war, has endured in collective memory, but that's also what I'm trying to go against. Um, and so continuing from the idea of nuclear sublime, um, there is a, a whole genre of photography um, of nuclear phenomena, which this is not, this is not nuclear photography, but it's sometimes called nuclear photography or atomic photography. And it's a, uh, it's a specific genre that comes up against the struggle of how to represent the invisible of nuclear phenomena. Um, that is the, the nuclear radiation, nuclear power and its consequences. But I want to say that there are some similarities between um, nuclear photography and the photography of the Gulf War aftermath that interests her, us here. In particular, the idea that no matter what exactly they depict, such images allude to incommensurable scales of destruction and death over the long term, due to the environmental damage created by radiation or, in this case, by oil pollution. The long-term effects of the damage, um, this is, this is um, a reportage by a, a photographs by Steve McCurry. I'm going to talk about that a bit later. Um, the long-term effects of the damage and the victims themselves cannot be directly vi visualized in these photographs of the Gulf War. And like nuclear photographs, they require ekphrastic discourse, that is, words, to make explicit that which cannot be directly seen in a picture. This point is made uh, in the article accompanying Steve McCurry's photo reportage in National, National Geographic from August 1991, 
For instance, in this passage, human health is already being affected in ways and degrees perhaps never to be known with certainty. Respiratory ailments appear to be increasing markedly and researchers worry about carcinogens in the great cloud. So they were wondering about these things <coughs> at the time. Um, McCurry's reportage in National Geographic focused specifically on the various types of environmental damage provoked by the oil well fires and the oil slick in the Gulf, the consequences of which people were not very familiar with at the time. Indeed, attention to ecological issues um, had actually been quite marginal compared to, for one thing, compared to the widespread fear of a nuclear apocalypse from the, the Cold War, and also compared to our familiarity now with these issues. Um, in, in his 2011 book, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, a book that combines eco-criticism and post-colonial studies, Robert Nixon argues that despite the ostentatious and dramatic spectacle displayed in war photographs, such as those oil well, oil well pictures, War's most important damage remains that which is invisible in the short term. This particular framing of the issue of visibility and invisibility of war damage is of course crucial for a visual medium like photography. Nixon urgently reminds us that the spectacle of the Gulf War overshadowed other concurrent but invisible trauma among which the consequences of the use for the first time by the US military during the, the, the Gulf War of depleted uranium weapons. These are linked to the series of cancers caused by Gulf War illness, a condition that he categorizes as part of the bodily aftermath, I quote, of the war, but which took years to be legally recognized as a combat-related illness. So Robert Nixon focuses on the challenge of scale when striving to acknowledge the negative effects of depleted uranium, its miniaturism, indeed when it's used, it's, uh, it's pul pulverized into a radioactive dust that does not discriminate victims. Its miniaturism makes it impossible to see, let alone to include in the narrative of the causes of war casualties. It stands no chance of being recognized in photographic form when the vast scale of the desert and of the gigantic plumes of smoke offer such a rewarding aesthetic experience. So focusing upon these kind of images and the overwhelming sense of doom they conveyed may have obscured or delayed the acknowledgement of other simultaneously unfolding trauma. Traumas, actually. Um, the photographs of the oil wells fires fit quite nicely into the US government's narrative of Iraq, Iraqi wickedness and sole responsibility, diverting attention from the concurrent massacre provoked by American bombings of a large number of retreating soldiers and civilians. This, these, uh, this is in the black and white photographs on the right. Um, uh, along the, the in, now infamously nicknamed Highway of Death. Another human disaster happening at the same time and over several months after the war was the Kurdish crisis and exodus taking place in northern Iraq, which you can see a photo of in the, on the left. So to conclude, photographs of the Kuwaiti burning oil wells in the aftermath of the Gulf War must be replaced into the context of first, the material reality of their production in which photographers had to contend with incredibly challenging conditions at the limit of the possibility of photography, we, we might argue. Um, secondly, in the context of the art historical legacies from which they stem, the sublime. Um, I briefly touched upon the natural and the nuclear sublime, but more can be said of visual precedents for these images. Um, and so this, this uh, context of the art historical legacies gives us clues about the cultural relationship to nature um, and the landscape, landscape. And they must be replaced, thirdly, in the context of the political environment that surrounded their production and dissemination. I spoke of the first use of depleted uranium weapons, but could have also mentioned the context of the fear of peak oil apocalypse um, do, linked with the, the oil market, which is also relevant in regards to these images.
So the, the gesture of burning the oil wells was carried out by the Iraqi army for a variety of reasons, uh, including revenge, uh, a, a, a ruining wealthy Kuwait, impacting oil prices on the global art market, uh, the global oil market, sorry. <laughs> nice. Um, but arguably, I'm used to saying art market too much. Um, so it, it could have been a f for a revenge or impacting oil prices on the global oil market, a, a variety of reasons. But arguably, the environmental damage ultimately caused harm to more than just Kuwait and only very marginally depleted oil resources, despite appearances. Um, so with, with the background of these two um, undeniably beautiful pictures that, that Sebastian Salgado took of this event, I want to propose to reflect on whether this gesture of setting the oil wells on fire was somehow made for the cameras in this highly mediated war. The subsequent invocation by journalists, commentators and artists of the apocalypse and the de facto use of the landscape as a terror tool visually made mediated by the camera, all this made this gesture worth it for the, pre for, the, for the perpetrators. So can the camera be seen as complicit in the oil wells firing as much as it was complicit in obscuring the long-term invisible consequences of the war for so long? Thank you.